Hey, beloved, welcome to Fox Souls COVID Town Hall. We're glad that you joined us tonight. We thought this would be an important conversation to have. And joining me tonight is my co-host all the way from the mix. I'm a fan of his, Mr. Anton <laughs> Peoples. Hey, Anton. Hey, Dr. Sean, man, it's to be on uh, a panel with you, man. I look at your show all the time too, brother. So I am definitely a fan of yours as well. Well, flattery will get you everywhere, young man. <laughs> It'll get you everywhere. Listen, man, so we're here tonight because, you know, we want to have a frank and honest conversation about COVID-19 and more so about this vaccine. Because as you know, Anton, it, there's a lot being said about it. Absolutely, absolutely. And tonight, we are going to debunk the myths and give you the facts on COVID-19 and taking the vaccine. This, this year has been... Ooh, it's been crazy for all of us. How have you been handling the, the pandemic? Slowly but surely, sir. <laughs> Slowly but surely. It's been, it's, it's been the kind of year you can't forget and the kind of year you don't want to remember. And yet okay. here we are. Um, I know as it relates to this uh, vaccine particularly, and, and just for full disclosure, Anton, let me just say it. I'm fully vaccinated and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm just saying okay. I'm just so we saying. are polar opposites in that way because I am not vaccinated and I don't plan on getting vaccinated. So this should See? be a very interesting panel for that. This, this, this is the beauty of the moment because you don't, you don't want to get vaccinated. And I, I was like the first in line. <laughs> I, wow. couldn't, I couldn't wait to get my butt in that vaccination line. <laughs> um, um, bef li listen, listen, before we go any further, real quick, I know we got a lot to cover, but but can you say a little bit about why, you know, that's your position? Absolutely. Um, I'm a 32 year old, you know, young man. I still consider myself young. I'm young to many people. I live a very healthy lifestyle. I don't have any pre existing conditions. Um, I get checkups regularly. I don't have high blood pressure. Um, you know, I make sure I even get um, IVs with vitamin C, you know, regularly as well. And so I feel as though I don't need to take that measure of getting a vaccine when I am healthy as an ox. Yeah, well, you know, listen, that we're here tonight and, and tonight is a no judgment, no shame kind of zone, right? Uh, a part, a part, I fundamentally believe, Anton, there can be no new knowledge without new dialogue and conversation. Absolutely. And we're here to have a conversation. And we're here to, to let people, and you know, just like you did, air what you think and what you believe. Uh, we have some magnificent panelists who are here tonight uh, to help us uh, you know, navigate our way through this conversation. I know, that, I know that Black hesitancy is a real thing. I know that we have the Tuskegee experiment, right? We, we've all heard of that. Uh, and that. And that's been a part of uh, the legacy of African-Americans as it relates uh, to the 1932 disaster that came along with that. Um, Henrietta Lacks, Anton? Mm -hmm. Another one, another one, man. You know, I want to talk a little bit more about the Tuskegee experiment for anyone who doesn't know, just to give them a little bit more of a grasp on how horrific um, that situation was. So it happened in 1932, and the Public Health Service, working with the Tuskegee Institute, began to study and they called it a Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. Now the study uh, initially involved about 600 black men. The study was conducted without the benefit of patients informed consent. They did not receive the proper treatment needed to cure their illness and many black men died. And although originally projected to last six months, the study actually went on for 40 years. It was just crazy. Bill Clinton, actually, uh, when he was president, he apologized. So today, America does remember the hundreds of men used in research without their knowledge and consent. Remember them and their family members. Men who were poor and African-American, without resources and with few alternatives. They believed they had found hope when they were offered free medical care by the United States Public Health Service. They were betrayed. Well, there you, you know, have it. Be, yeah, you have to be quite honest, like that was one of the reasons why I decided I don't want to get the vaccine because, you know, my dad told me about this and it really, 
Ooh, it, 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 it shook me. It shook me to believe that they would do this to so many black men in our country. And still to this day, like none of them get free, you know, health care after, you know, they had syphilis for so many years. And I thought to myself, if the government could hide this from us, what else could they do? Yeah, it's, it's a fair question. And it's certainly a question that exists in the zeitgeist of, uh, of black culture. Uh, we've also heard of Henrietta Lacks, who was the first immortalized human cell line, one of the most important cell lines in medical research history. Her cells were taken without her consent. We've also heard about how Johnson & Johnson baby powder uh, and what goes on with that. Anton, uh, I know you know a little bit about this. I absolutely do, man. It's it's devastating. And, and when, when you hear these stories, you remind yourself, okay, I live in America and I have to make sure that I am safe and protected, but how can, can I trust this new vaccine that's just come out when I have this history, our black history, when, when they've shown us to maybe not trust. And, and I'll tell you this, I am open. I am absolutely 100% open to hearing um, these, these myths be debunked and to getting facts. And if someone today can tell me that it is safe to take this vaccine with 100% without any doubt, you know, I would be open to, to, to investigating it again, to maybe getting the vaccine in the future. Well, well listen, I, th I think that's the beginning of a, of a significant moment. Why, why, why don't you uh, begin uh, to help uh, both of us introduce our, our panel? Uh, I'll, I'll let you go first, because I, I defer to the young and beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, listen, flattery gets you everywhere, man, everywhere. <laughs> okay, well, first joining us tonight, uh, we have Dr. Frida Lewis-Hall, an award-winning advocate for health equity and the chief patient officer and EVP for Pfizer. Welcome, Dr. Frida. How are you? Doing well. Thank you so much. Also Hello. joining us tonight is Dr. Derek DeWitt. He's the president of the board of directors for the Maryland Baptist Age at Home Development Corporation. Dr. DeWitt, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for having me, my pleasure. Yes. We also have uh, Karen Jones and she's the president and CEO of the National Caucus and Center of Black Aging. Hello, Ms. Karen Jones, how are you? Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. And finally joining us tonight is Dr. Takesha Davis. She's the president and CEO of the New Orleans East Hospital. She's the only African-American woman hospital CEO in the state of Louisiana. Dr. Davis, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for having me, Dr. Sean. Looking forward to the conversation. It's a lot of doctors. Oh, no, so sir. No. People in this room. no, no, no. I, I think uh, to all of you, thank you for your time. And thank you for your uh, participation. We have a lot of ground to cover uh, and there are a lot of questions out there. I think not the least of which is one of the things we want to do tonight is debunk, you know, myths and to make sure that we are we are we are dealing with the questions that people happen to be asking, because uh, this is too serious. Uh, for us to sort of just poo-poo on what people are thinking. There's a kind of elitism that happens um, when people don't take questions seriously. Um, Dr. Uh, DeWitt, uh, let me ask you this, sir. I know, I know one of the things, I heard that you were able to not have any instance of COVID in your facility. Did I get that right? Yes, sir. Throughout the entire pandemic, our nursing home has been COVID-free to include our residents and our employees. So. We're very proud of that fact and also being a um, black owned and operated nursing home. We were founded 100 years ago as the Maryland Back Age Home for Colored People because African-Americans could not get into traditional nursing homes. Um, so churches came together and founded our own. So we're proud of the fact that even in a marginalized community and in a nursing uh, long term care setting where most uh, or a large portion of the deaths from COVID took place, we are COVID free. So well, listen, li listen, sir, I, I, I had, to, I, I was completely out of order, but I had to ask you that because I, fi I find it to be remarkable that you were able to achieve that. Anton, I know we have a, a video, our first video. And so, and so how about I let you 
uh, throw the dat because you know you you are better at this than I. Am. <laughs> you know, I, I love working with you. I think we need to work together more often. Actually. I'm all for it. Why don't you give me a hat? <laughs> I got you. Okay, so we'll be taking a question uh, from our soul soulmates all night uh, tonight, and our first question comes from Gentel. Hey, I'm Gentel Cherie. My question is, can the viral vector vaccine give someone COVID-19? Mm. Yes, that's a question. <laughs> a lot of people are asking that question. Uh -huh. So Dr. Takesha Davis, All right. you know, please tell me, uh, can the vaccine give me COVID if I got it? Because I got the vaccine. Do I have COVID? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, the, so the, the short answer is um, the viral vector vaccine cannot give you COVID. Uh, neither can the mRNA vaccines give you COVID. Um, the way in which the vaccines are made um, are different, right? So we're using those terms viral vector versus mRNA depends on the, the piece of the vaccine that is used in the process to actually spark that antibody response but it does not contain the entire virus to be able to give you COVID. So you cannot get COVID-19 from the vaccine. Okay, th this is important, Antar, just, 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 just bear with me because I, th I think a lot of people need to hear this. Uh, I, I, I literally just talked, Dr. Davis, I literally just talked to somebody yesterday who was concerned that the vaccine was gonna give them a mild form of the disease. You're saying, just say that again. Please. It cannot. <laughs> the <laughs> COVID-19 vaccine cannot biologically, physiologically give you COVID-19 because it does not contain all components of the COVID-19 virus, right? The coronavirus, SARS-CoV-19. It doesn't contain it. So it cannot give you COVID-19. Now, will you get side effects? Likelihood of that is yes, but that is not COVID-19. So we need to be really clear about that, that the vaccine cannot give you the virus. It's a very powerful, powerful thing. Uh, Dr. Frieda Lewis Hall, I want to bring you in, if I may, uh, because Anton and I started the show by uh, rehearsing, and I mean that po positively, not pejoratively, by rehearsing many of the negative uh, arguments and thoughts about the vaccine. I'm going to ask you a very blunt and direct question, and I, I'm, I'm, I, I can tell by your carriage you're going to answer in kind. <laughs> Why should Black people trust this vaccine? Um, okay, yes, I will answer that in kind. First, let me do one thing, though, and that is to correct uh, my title. I am now retired. I am the former uh, chief patient officer and chief medical officer at Pfizer, but I am, in quote, retired now. I think that means tired again, but that's another story. <laughs> so why should we trust the vaccine? Um, yeah. For a whole host of reasons. First of all, um, the vaccines, the three vaccines that are approved in the United States all went through very large clinical trials, literally tens of thousands of people in each of the trials for the three vaccines. Those clinical trials were designed and implemented with the oversight of independent review boards and others. And when the data came in, that data from these tens of thousands of patients was reviewed by the independent boards, by specialists in the area at the FDA and by the CDC before they actually came to the public. The second thing is ongoing safety surveillance is a part of the release of that vaccine. So it's not like, okay, we said it's safe, now we're done, we're not looking at it anymore. There's active surveillance to understand what problems may um, evolve now that you've gone from tens of thousands of people to hundreds of thousands of people getting the vaccine. The third thing I hear people say is, you know, I'm gonna let a couple people get it first. And, you know, after they do that, I'm gonna go ahead and get mine. There've been over 200 million doses given in the United States, 200 million doses given in the United States. And that safety surveillance that I just talked about um, is ongoing. So when I got the vaccine, if I had side effects, those would have been reported. And if you got the vaccine, and you had side effects, 
again, we capture that information, we add it up, and we take a look at it to ensure that it's still safe. Mm, thank you for that. And can I add one other thing? I'm Please. sorry. Absolutely. Um, but a lot of people ask me, I get called every day. And a lot of people ask me, mm -hmm, y'all said it takes 10 years to develop one of these. How all of a sudden did you do it in 10 months? I was going to say that. I, I was know you were. <laughs> Please, thank you for, for clearing this up. So here's what happens. In, in vaccine development, usually you take one step, you take a look, you wait for a while, you make some decisions, um, you set up new trial sites, you do another part of the trial, you know, and you do it in steps. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, because it was so urgent, we identified the sites that were going to do the trials. We did a lot of the work at the same time. We shared data between companies, which doesn't always happen. I mean, it was literally all hands on deck. And a lot of the paperwork that happens between each phase of a study was sped up. So not shortcuts in the safety or the science, but really making a more efficient system for getting this out in, in an emergency. Ms. Jones, we, I'm, I'm gonna have to jump in. We gotta take a break because we, we gotta pay some bills. Oh, that's um, right. But, but, but listen, I'm, look, Anton and I, we're here to learn and we're here just with the audience. We are, we are, we are questioners as much as everybody else. And so thank you for that. Anton, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, let's go to some more questions. Is that all right? Oh, yes, man. Because I got a lot more questions for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back to Fox Soul Vaccine Special. We are here with an esteemed panel and I'm joined uh, by my good friend now. I think we've become a good friend, Mr. <laughs> Dr. Right. Sean. Yes, and I, I'm a lot less esteemed than these panelists, but it's still good. <laughs> well, me too, brother. So it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> I would love to jump into a, another soulmate question, uh, if you don't mind. So we're going to jump into a question from Tammy. Hi, this is Tamara from Shreveport, Louisiana. I'm a type 1 diabetic and have con some concerns about getting vaccine after the Johnson Johnson hoopla. So what do you think? Mm. Well, yes, I know, Anton, a lot of people who have pre-existing conditions and who are dealing with that. So, uh, Dr. Davis, <laughs> we, we, we're going to work you to death. That's, a, um, that's why we're here. Can you, can you provide it? Because it's a very legitimate question. People with pre-existing conditions, especially with diabetes particularly, um, what's the relationship between those conditions and this vaccine? It's a very, very important question because we know, especially in the minority community, we are burdened uh, with the higher prevalence of a lot of pre-existing conditions like type 1 diabetes, hypertension, uh, obesity, and others. Um, the clinical trials um, that Dr. Frieda talked about included uh, individuals with many of these um, pre-existing conditions, but more importantly, the 200 million individuals who have received the vaccine uh, already represent um, our community members with all of these conditions. Uh, and so what we have not found is that there is any significant increased risk of adverse events uh, in those with pre-existing conditions. And more importantly, um, individuals with pre-existing conditions, especially diabetes, are at higher risk for poor outcomes if you get COVID. Yeah. Diabetes is one yeah. of the conditions that has been associated with a higher risk of death um, with COVID-19. Uh, yeah. So those were pre-existing conditions. We strongly encourage to get the vaccine and be first in line because of what we know about COVID and the impact that it's having on our community members with those conditions. And there are there is no data to suggest um, that there is increased risk of any adverse outcomes with those conditions. You know, An Anton, real quick before we throw to the next video, Karen Jones, let me ask you a question because I know that you work uh, with, uh, you with the National Caucus and Center on Black Aging. And I know you work with a population who have a lot of pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, you've had to talk them through this, walk them through it. When you've had to do that, what did you say to our elders, to the elders of our village that made them more comfortable with what um, we feel, or some of us feel anyway, was in their best interest to do? 
Well, first of all, let me tell you that I was also someone who was hesitant. This time last year, if you told me that I had already gotten my vaccination and I have been vaccinated, uh, I was very hesitant because I too grew up in the African-American community. I understand the hesitancy. I understand our history. Uh, so it was very important to me because we knew, and everybody knows early on, uh, it was impacting our community greater than any other. You know, it is true when America gets a cold, African-American community gets pneumonia. And that was truly the case that happened with COVID. So one of the things I have to do and my responsibility is to educate myself. And I knew once I educated myself, my responsibility then was to make sure that our seniors had as much information as possible so that they would feel comfortable and know uh, we weren't telling people to get the vaccine. We were giving them the information and empowering them to make that decision. So yeah. I joined a coalition uh, uh, convened with some others, uh, 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 national organizations. We have now uh, the COVID-19 vaccine education and uh, equity project. Uh, where we made sure we followed uh, the understood what the vaccine was. We followed the regulatory process, uh, the approval process to make sure that uh, the gold standard in terms of approval. Ms. Jones, Ms. Jones, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, but let, let, me, let me just say this, because I, 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 wanna, I wanna make sure that we emphasize this. What I'm hearing you say, and then Anton, we're gonna go through this video, you can tee it up. What I'm hearing you say is a part of the great work that you were able to do with the folks, the elders that you work with, was to engage them in conversation, give them information. And I think, I think, I think that is the secret sauce. And, uh, and so, and so, you know, for everybody watching tonight, you know, that, that is how you do it. You, the more information you have from credible sources, the better decision you can make. Anton, let's, let's tee up this next video. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, this next soulmate question comes from Ms. Keisha, Florida. Hi. So my 83-year-old father received the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. A week later, he contracted COVID. He was hospitalized and rehab and everything. He's actually doing really well. However, what I'm trying to figure out is, at this point, do I have him take the second shot, even though it's not within the three-week, you know, time schedule time period? Or do I have him start the whole cycle again and take the first shot and the second shot? I could use some help here. Thanks. You see my face? <laughs> 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 okay, well that's uh that's a little interesting. So uh Dr. Davis, <laughs> coming back to you. Um, and I'm coming back to you because um I think it's important that you know, we get information from doctors about this vaccine first and foremost. Um, and then Dr. Frieda, uh, you as well. Dr. Davis, could you could you tackle that question? And Anton, I think you have a question after that. Yeah. Yeah, this this is a really important question um, for us to be able to, to answer because number one, um, uh, she stated that her father um, contracted COVID after getting the first dose. So the first thing to remind everybody is if it's a two dose vaccine, you got to get both doses uh, to get up to that 94 to 95% um, efficacy. You've got to get both doses. So absolutely you can get COVID after having um, that one dose. Um, but the question is, should you get vaccinated after you have COVID? The answer is resoundingly yes because we do not know that once you get COVID, how long you'll have that natural immunity, those antibodies. It looks like it may last up to 90 days, but we're still in that process of studying it. So you should get the vaccine. You don't have to start the series over, um, but you should get the vaccine. One caveat uh, is that if her father had received special treatments while in the hospital, like convalescent plasma, or monoclonal antibodies, which are two treatments used uh, to minimize and improve, minimize the um, negative impact of COVID and improve outcomes, then it's recommended that he wait at least 90 days from those treatments to get that second dose. But absolutely, he should get the second dose of the vaccine series, even though it's outside of the recommended window. And I'd love to hear uh, from Dr. Frida, because I know she's probably getting this question just about every day as I, 
uh, because we have so many community members who are getting vaccinated um, and after that first dose, not following those public health guidelines and getting COVID. So absolutely, I think two really important points and thank you, Dr. Davis for um, underscoring these things. First of all is around, you are not really fully vaccinated until about two weeks after your second dose, if you are in a two dose regimen, two weeks after your one dose, if you're in a one dose regimen. So if you do one dose, two weeks after that, if you do two doses, two weeks after your second dose. Because of that, it is possible to be infected just before you're vaccinated or just after you're vaccinated. So it's important to continue to take all the precautions, to be very careful and to be on the lookout for symptoms. That's good. That's good. Anton, I know, I know you wanted to jump in and ask something. So let's, let's at least get that in before we throw it to another break. Absolutely. Actually, my question is for uh, Ms. Karen Jones. I know you stated earlier that you previously were not going to get the vaccine because you know of the disparities in our culture and, you know, in our community and how you didn't really feel like you could trust the vaccine. So what was that turning point for you that made you say, okay, you know, this is, this is something I could do? That's a great question. Well, I educated myself. I found out I got the information. I made sure that I got uh, worked with experts who not only understood what the process was, uh, and though I knew, again, that then it would be my responsibility to share that with our seniors uh, so that they felt more comfortable, particularly because, it, uh, again, uh, COVID had just so impacted our community and really hit older uh, African-Americans. And so once I did that, uh, and I must tell you that I had my own hesitancy, but it also was uh, the leadership at the time that made me very cautious of it. And well, so there's, uh, al there's <laughs> always that. You know, because listen, no, I have to say that because I have gotten a shingle shot. I've gotten a pneumonia shot. I've done other vaccines. I travel. I've had to get tetanus shots and I've not questioned what's in that. So I was very concerned about the vaccine only because of the leadership at the time. So I educated myself on it. We've made sure that we gave that same information out. We, we worked with uh, trusted leaders in the community to get the message out to educate our folks. And now we're finding that the hesitancy, particularly on older African-Americans, uh, they're waiting in line. They want, th their only problem now is access getting, you know, getting there, you know, we had a problem with the appointments and all that has been pretty much resolved, not completely, but we worked really hard to make sure that our seniors got it. And I'm very proud that our people really learned about it. They made strong decisions and they moved ahead. Mm. It, it's a beautiful thing. Dr. DeWitt, before we take our break, our next break, let me ask you a question because I think you represent an important constituency and our, among our people in the black community, that being the black church. Um, as, you, as you encounter uh, religious communities, particularly your own, uh, what has been the reception or receptivity of this uh, vaccine as it relates to this virus? Well, in our facility, we, we had our first vaccination clinic on December the 23rd. On December the 24th, I got a phone call saying only 11 of 42 employees in the first facility took the vaccination. And I was floored by that information. And now we're fast forward to April, we still have a few employees that haven't taken it. But I would say, the, the, and the skepticism and the hesitancy range from everything that's been mentioned from the, you know, from the, tri the, the Tuskegee uh, syphilis trials to the, you know, QAnon conspiracy, microchip, market of beast, you name it, we heard it all. But to, um, to that point, how we combated that was the information, like, like Ms. Karen said, give them the true facts and information. And it took a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversation with people to turn their minds about hesitancy. And I think that's gonna be the key, but it also enlisting people who they trust, their faith-based leaders, their pastors, bishops, you know, uh, priests, their Ebons, those people who they trust to help get a positive message out surrounding the vaccines. I love it. I love it. Anton, how about we take a break? What do you think? Yeah, man, I think we need to take a little break. I think we need to pay some bills. Just a few, just a few minor bills. And we'll come right back on Fox Soul, everybody.
Welcome to Fox Souls' COVID-19 Town Hall. Look, tonight we are debunking the myths and setting it straight for you, Black America. Now, on the break, uh, Karen was actually talking to us about the hesitancy in the Black community. Can, can you uh, follow up a little bit and, and tell us what you were saying to, to me on the break? Well, again, early on, we knew that people were going to be hesitant and we know the history and we, we, we acknowledge that. We didn't try to overcome it. But what we did is we really tried to give people as much information as possible. And what I wanted to say to you, Anton, is I had a son who is young, professional athlete, healthy, does all the things right that you're supposed to do. And he got COVID. And he thought he was not, he was going to be okay because he was young and healthy and, and athletic and what have you. And, and, and it hit him. And so uh, fortunately it didn't, uh, you know, he didn't have to be hospitalized, but I know he doesn't ever want to get it again. And as soon as his 90 days is up, guess who's going to be in line getting that vaccine? He yes. never wants to feel like that again. I don't want that to happen to you or any other uh, young people who assume that they're healthy and they don't need it. It is something that we do not only for ourselves, but for our families to protect them and to protect our communities. And that's crucial and important in the African-American community. You know, you talking to me just now, it, it, it gave me the sense of like a motherly Talk. Yeah, I, I got that say. I got I that mother spirit came over me. That mom spirit hit me hard in my in my soul. I was like, okay, all right, mom. Shoot, I might just have to. Yeah, well, and, and listen, the, listen to your mother. Listen yeah. to yeah. And in the in the immortal words of my mother, I know that's right. Doctor Davis, let, <laughs> let me let, let me ask you a question. Um, and so a Anton got one of his questions answered. I'm I'm a, I'm gonna get my own little personal question in. I'm gonna put it in Shakespearean terms when it comes to mass. To do or not to do? That is the question. Ah, <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, and it is to do. Uh, it is extremely important uh, for us to remember uh, that we need to follow the public health guidelines in addition to getting vaccinated because everybody isn't vaccinated. Uh, those 200 million people who have gotten doses amounts to about a third of adults getting one dose at least uh, in the U.S. Uh, and so we are far from being where we need to be uh, to be able to feel comfortable that we're near that herd immunity or having enough adults and children who have gotten the vaccine to where we can all be safe walking around indoors and outdoors. Uh, we know that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention just gave new guidelines for those who are fully vaccinated uh, when they're outdoors to be able to be unmasked based on the science. Uh, but if you're indoors and you are fully vaccinated, you still have a high likelihood of potentially contracting COVID and spreading it. Uh, mm -hmm. So really important uh, for us to continue to mask. So to do in your Shakespearean terms, mm -hmm. we need to continue to wear a mask. I, I love like it. I and can I add to do properly so your, your mask has to fit properly yes. it can't be down around your chin or hanging off your ear or in your pocket right so it Maybe really under is, your nose that's right so it's wearing it properly and um continuing to social distance and to wash hands so it's all of that all the time but mask 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 and mask right all right anton let's let's have another question Absolutely. Uh, so we're going to go to our next soulmate question from Frankie Robinson. Hi, this is Frankie Robinson from Chicago, and I took the COVID vaccine. But my question is, is it effective to combat all strains of COVID or only one specific strain of COVID? Thanks. That was good. Davis. Mm. That is a really good question. So the, um, as we know, uh, that COVID vaccine uh, is getting smarter by the day. Every time it has a, a host or someone who has not been vaccinated or has antibodies, it has the potential to change uh, and continue to spread. And so we've seen many variants um, that have uh, come into uh, circulation. The initial vaccines, uh, Pfizer and Moderna, uh, as they were being developed, uh, there were certain variants that were predominant at that time uh, when Johnson & Johnson was being developed. There were more variants. Uh, and so at this point, 
Uh, we know that those vaccines uh, are effective against the most uh, predominant variants in uh, our community, but we don't know, and this is important whenever we're having these conversations to be transparent about what we don't know, uh, is that as we continue uh, to have hesitancy, agnostic um, uh, behavior towards the vaccine and still have variants developing, if they will be effective against new variants. Um, so it's important for us to remember, uh, as Dr. Frieda said to us earlier, that we're still studying the safety uh, and the effectiveness as this vaccine as we go on, um, because we're only a couple of months out, seven, eight months uh, from vaccines being available to the public. So we need to remind ourselves of that. But great question, and we need to stay informed as we go on in monitoring the effectiveness of the vaccines. Dr. Takesha, I have a quick question. Do you foresee us having to have a third or a fourth vaccine? I foresee that we will need to have a booster. And I think about this uh, in the sense of flu vaccines. And uh, it's a very good analogy because the flu is a virus that circulates uh, and also mutates or develops variants, which is why we have to get a different flu vaccine every year because there's a different variant circulating. The COVID vaccine and the coronavirus seems to be behaving in the same way. So that as we continue to study this, when we get to 12 months, uh, we may learn that the predominant variant, that the vaccines are not effective or that maybe our immunity is waning uh, and is not strong enough to prevent us from being affected, infected. So we need to get a booster. So I do think we should all be preparing ourselves to think about this, that we will be getting a booster, maybe at a year, maybe every year, just like the flu vaccine, but we're still studying that. Um, but that's the way it looks like it's going. Well, listen, um, I, we got to take a break. Uh, but but Dr. Derek, when we come back, I want to hear how in the world nobody in your facility got COVID because I think that's you're hard. holding out on a little secret sauce. <laughs> and we need a little bit of it when we come back. Let's take this break and we all going to steal from Dr. Derek. How okay. about that? <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. You're watching the Foxhole COVID-19 Town Hall. Thank you for watching. And I know thus far you have been edified by what I think is a rich conversation. Dr. DeWitt, yes, sir. <laughs> I'm not letting you get out of here tonight without telling me how in the bejesus, did you, <laughs> how, how, did you, how did you not get COVID in your facility? And I heard, sir, that you have a great story about how you motivated folks in your facility to act on the issue we're talking about. Tell me those two things real quick. Well, first of all, we I believe our success, and I don't want it to sound like bragging because I think a lot of facilities could have done everything right and still have COVID in their facilities. But one of the things that we did, we acted very early. We were what I call the four E's to pandemic response that I'm, I'm including in a book that I'm writing, but we acted very early. We were um, excessive and we were extreme and we were emotional. And when I say early, when I heard President uh, former president say we only had 15 cases, it would be over by the end of the week. I knew we were in trouble. Um, so we began to act right then. We began to, um, we shut down our facility. We began to um, ex be excessive in the stockpiling of our PPE, putting our procedures, practices, and protocols in effect right away. Um, we took a lot of flack being a faith-based facility, locking down our facility and people are saying, well, I thought, you know, you trusted in God and I would just tell them, listen, I trust in God, but I'm still going to wear my seatbelt when I get in the car, right? Come on, so that, come on. This, How about this, that? This is seatbelt measures that we're taking here. And we, we just uh, made sure that we, in doing all of this, we understood that now we're going to isolate our residents. So we have to look out for the emotional well-being, the emotional well-being of our uh, of our uh, employees. So we took some steps emotionally to make sure that they were okay. Like we, we didn't want our employees taking public transportation. This is what I mean by we were very extreme in our measures. We supplemented their costs for them to take 
private transportation so that they wouldn't take the chance of bringing COVID into the facility. Right, right, so we right. have to go above and beyond what, what everybody said we should do or thought we should do. The story, I think- um, Dr. I, DeWitt, hold, hold that story, because my, my first commitment is to getting the people's questions answered. So, yes. so just hold that story. And okay. Anton, take us, take us to another question and we'll come back to that. Absolutely. Uh, so our next soulmate question, it's coming from Miss Kaden Chapman. Hi, I'm Kaden and I'm 15 years old and I'm a student and I'm in high school and I'm in ninth grade. And so I was just wondering for, do you really have to get the vaccine? Does it really help like from COVID? Because my teacher got the COVID test and the vaccine and he still got COVID. So it was like, does it even work? Like, are we just taking it to take it? That's what I want to know. First of all, I love her. <laughs> I just absolutely love her. <laughs> Anton, you throw this somewhere because I just love her. That's all I want to say. <laughs> you know what? I, I love her honesty and I love how just sincere she is. And it's a real question. And I've had the same question as well. Dr. Davis. Could you could you please answer this one for us? Yeah, I, I, I love the fact that our, our young people, right, are uh, engaged in this conversation because uh, we need them uh, to get vaccinated. We know right now at least one of the vaccines is approved for those um, down those youth down to the age of sixteen. So we're encouraging them to get vaccinated, much like you, Anton. Um, there's a lot of hesitancy uh, in our young people because. Um, you all think you're invincible, uh, and we all were young once, so we understand. Um, but it's really important uh, for young people to get vaccinated because uh, while um, you die at a higher rate uh, at an older age, uh, our young people are able to spread uh, COVID-19 to those who are more vulnerable. We just recently uh, here in New Orleans had uh, a 20-something-year-old um, nursing home a worker uh, who did not get vaccinated, although offered the vaccine um, and brought COVID-19 into the nursing home, infected 20 of the residents uh, and two of them died. Uh, so it's important to think about um, the impact to those who we love dearly and care about, our yeah. moms, our dads, our grandmas, papas, and then they yeah. godfathers. D Dr. Um, Davis, Dr. Dr. Davis, Dr. Davis, I don't, I don't mean to cut you off. I want, I want to get another question in, but let, let, let's answer her question succinctly and clear. Yes. Does the vaccine work? Yes, the vaccine works, but it's not 100% effective. Vaccines are 94 to 95% effective. Mm -hmm. So that means that some people may get COVID if you're not masking, socially distancing, uh, and washing your hands. That's why it's important to do both. Yes, it is. And, and, and Anton, in the same way that you can get vaccinated for the chicken pox and still get the chicken pox, it's <laughs> for COVID. Anton, real quick, play, let's go to another video and let's get a really quick answer to this before we take this break. Absolutely. So our next soulmate uh, question comes from Miss Tiffany Garlington. Hello, my name is Tiffany Nelms. I'm from Los Angeles, California. My question today is, I've been hearing a lot of talk of herd immunity. However, I would like to know exactly what does herd immunity mean? Listen, Dr. Frieda, give me, give me a short answer to this because I, I got to take this break, but I want to answer her question. Dr. Frieda, go ahead. So herd immunity is when enough people in a community have immunity to the virus, either because they've been infected or they've been vaccinated. To make it so the vac the, that the virus doesn't really have any place to go. So basically we take all of the people who could be infected, we make them immune to the virus and that protects the entire community. Mm. All right, people, listen, you're watching the Fox Soul COVID Town Hall, and I know you're loving it. How could you not? Anton's here. We'll you know back. what I'm saying? <laughs> we got Dr. Sean, so with the both of us, you got to be loving something about it. <laughs> oh, go to break. Hey, beloved, you're watching the Fox Soul COVID-19 Town Hall. Uh, thank you for watching tonight. Dr. DeWitt, you tried to ask uh, Anton a question during the break, and I did not allow it to happen because I wanted it to happen on the air. 
Go ahead and ask Anton a question. Yeah, I just wanted to ask him how does he feel about getting vaccinated now? You know, Anton, Mr. T was scared of needles too. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, that was a low blow, dog. That was a low blow. Listen, I, I will be very um, transparent in saying that, to be honest, these this conversation has really opened my my eyes and my ears um, to how important it is to get vaccinated and not for me, but for other people. And, you know, Miss Karen, I have to say, you know, I, I, I too have had COVID before. And so when you started talking about your son, it really resonated with me, that experience. And I don't ever want to get it again. And I got to keep it real with you. Like my mom is my biggest champion and you remind me a lot of my mother. So hearing you saying this, and she's been telling me the same thing. So I will say that I definitely am thinking more about getting the vaccine after this conversation, 100%. 100%. We all have nothing but love for you. And we, we wanna make sure that everybody has enough information to make the right decision. And we know that you will be able to do that because again, it's not really just about you. We want to protect you, but you want to be able to protect the people around you and the people that you come in contact with. And that's the only way we move to herd immunity and all the other things. So, you know, we have nothing but love for you. And we just want you to make sure that you're around for us to do this again and talk about something else. <laughs> hey, hey, Anton, this this has turned into a Book of Sean episode. I mean, okay, this, I, this, I feel it. You this, know what I mean? This got all emotional. I'm, I'm loving this. So, 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 Karen, Karen, before we run out of time, make sure you tell everybody about the Count Me In campaign. I know you're a part of it. Let us know what it is and how we can Absolutely. Help. Well, the COVID-19 Vaccine Education and Equity Project, which has over 200 organizations involved in making sure we get information out about the vaccine, we have a Count Me In campaign, which means that we have people who, who can go online and tell their story on why, they, why they're getting the vaccine or why they've gotten the vaccine. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people get it because they want to be safe in the classroom. Some people are getting it because they want to be able to hug their grandchildren. Different reasons. And we know, just like you, Anton, if you get the vaccine, you're going to make a lot of other people want to get the vaccine too. You're one of those trusted voices. And so that's what the Count Me In campaign does. It just gets everybody to share their story and why it's important to get vac vaccinated. Uh, Ms. Karen, how can viewers share their vaccination stories with the Count Me campaign? They can go to covidvaccineproject.org slash count me in and, and put up their picture if they want to. They certainly can tell their stories. Uh, and then most of all, they can see people just like themselves, people who look just like them and make them uh, feel more comfortable in making the decision to get vaccinated. So we certainly encourage people to go to that site. Listen, this has been a great conversation. We have a little more time left, uh, but I, I have vastly enjoyed uh, talking to all of you, and I've vastly enjoyed watching your auntie. <laughs> I, I, my soul has come alive in this. Um, uh, Dr. Frieda, let me ask you this. Here's a quick question I often hear. Is one vaccine just as good as any other, or is there a better one and a not so better one? Mm -hmm. I think the important thing is to get vaccinated. If you have special considerations, talk to your doctor. Um, if you're pregnant, for example, if you have one of the underlying conditions that we're concerned about and you have special concerns, talk to your doctor. But the important thing is to get vaccinated. Yeah. Listen, Anton, this has been a great, a great, uh, a great conversation we've had tonight. Um, you seem to have changed just a little bit. <laughs> you know, I feel the change. I feel the change. And I think one of the most important things that I learned, I, I believe um, Dr. DeWitt said it, is when you trust people and you get the right information, you can then go and make an informed decision on something. And I definitely feel the love with you all. And I, I, can, I trust you. You know, you're very intelligent people. So... You definitely have, have changed my mind a, a, a little bit. I'm not going to lie, you know, for sure. And I'm glad yeah. that I had this conversation with everybody because I know there's a lot of young people who have the same position that I do and who are watching right now. And so hopefully for them as well, you know, maybe it might have sparked something different for them too. Listen, you know, Anton, what I've gotten tonight, and then I'll let you throw uh, to, to, to our outro,
is stop watching videos and start talking to people. Mm. How about that? Ooh. Stop watching videos and start talking to people. A video will never be a substitute for actually having a real conversation with somebody who knows what the hell they're talking about. Come on. Anton, go ahead. That was a word. That, that's, that's, that's a mic drop <laughs> from Dr. Sean. Well, this conversation was incredible. And I thank all of you for joining us today and for the soulmates for watching. And please, 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 up next, make sure you watch the Tammy Mac Late Show. Only Tammy on Mac! Fox, only on Fox O, baby. Only on Fox O, baby. We got to do this again. I like Let's this. do it tomorrow. Hey, come on. <laughs>